Humbug YouTubers, and welcome to Big Budda at Christmas with me, Big Budda. And as this is a special Christmas episode, I thought I'd take a look at one of my favourite pieces of Christmas entertainment in this one, that being the children's drama serial, The Box of Delights. So the series has a very simple premise. Public schoolboy, back for the Christmas holidays in 1930s pre-war England, is travelling home to meet his governess. On the way, he meets an aged Punch and Judy man, who gives him a magic box for safekeeping, the eponymous Box of Delights, that allows Kay to perform many feats of magic. There are three things you must know about this box. You open it like this. If you push this to the right, you can go small. If you press it to the left, you can go swift. When he looks inside it, it's like Pandora's box. All sorts of magic breaks loose. Fantasy characters come to life. He can enter the world within the box and pretty much go anywhere. He can enter pictures on the wall. He can go into the ancient past and leave his own body. I love the design of the box. It features heavily in the opening credits accompanied by the first Noel. As soon as those credits start up, I'm four years old again, watching this story play out. In the scenes where Kay actually opens the box, it's a very simple special effect of the light emanating onto Kay's face. Although it's an easily achievable special effect, to my unsophisticated young mind that hadn't been inundated with fantastical imagery when I first watched the series as a child, as far as I was concerned, I was witnessing real magic when I saw this effect. I believed it just as much as Kay does in the story. After the old man is kidnapped, it falls on Kay to keep the box from falling into the hands of the villainous Abner Brown, and he uses his new toy to rescue his mentor in magic from the clutches of evil. The reason I want to look at this today is because, although the series does have something of a cult following, of which I very much identify myself as being part of, I think this should be heralded as much more of a classic than it is. It should be a staple of Christmas TV viewing. It should be held in the same regard in the UK that something like A Christmas Story is in the US. It should be shown every year, I think. It should be on repeat syndication. Cable channels should be broadcasting it in marathon sessions on a continuous loop. It should have its own line of culty merch, recite-along screenings, embarrassing sequels and musical versions. OK, the latter of those may already exist. This is a forgotten classic. It was repeated once at Christmas 86 and edited into three one-hour instalments, which is where I think I may have seen it for the first time. And then, to my knowledge, it was never repeated on British television and merely survives thanks to memory and VHS copies. Not only is this one of my earliest memories of television, it's also probably one of my earliest memories full stop. There's imagery in here that has stayed with me my whole life. Although I didn't watch it for many, many years, when I did revisit it about five years ago, there were images that leapt out and instantly regressed me back to that time in my life, when I first came online as a human being, essentially. The formation of myself as a person is synonymous with me watching this serial for the first time, and there are moments in here that are absolutely magical. It's one of those rare pieces of television that managed to capture lightning in a bottle. All the elements they got right, the tone, Devin Stanfield as Kay Harker was an absolutely perfect piece of casting. This was a young actor who was just a natural at capturing the wonder of witnessing magic. Patrick Troughton, who was the second Doctor of course, is fantastic as Cole Hawlings, the Punch and Judy man and owner of the Box of Delights. The villain Abner Brown, played by Robert Stevens, an actor incidentally who would later go on to marry his co-star in this, the Rocky Horror Picture Show's Patricia Quinn, shortly after he was knighted, making her Lady Patricia Quinn now. Robert Stevens makes an amazing villain. A lot of actors would be tempted to phone it in whilst doing children's drama, but Robert Stevens really gives it his all. It's an intense performance, it's a scary performance, a performance worthy of the RSC. And there are people who believe that Ramon Lully got the box when Arnold entered into the past without it. Now think! Think! This man had the elixir of eternal life and the box of delights with all its magic powers. If he were to give this performance in a film, Abner Brown would be remembered as one of the great movie villains. 
It's almost a shame he did this work on the small screen. I think TV can be seen as a largely disposable medium and not something that's preserved and revisited with quite the same reverence as film. And that's an imbalance that should be addressed, at least with a quality production like this. The music is perfect and it's just the right blend of whimsy and eeriness. The fact that it was shot on video so it looks of its time. The look of this series is so quintessentially early 80s BBC when it was decreed that budgets could go a lot further if productions were shot entirely on video. Thankfully this only lasted a few years when it was realised how cheap it could look. If this was a US production you could bet your bottom dollar that it would be shot on film but who knows Maybe that would diminish some of its magic. The mixture, as I said, of whimsy and eeriness in that way that only the BBC could achieve in the 80s. Although it's enchanting and whimsical, it's also incredibly creepy in places. That's a unique trick. I can't think of many things that manage to be both enchanting and creepy in equal measures. Maybe The Nightmare Before Christmas, but the comparisons are few and far between. This was the BBC's flagship drama of 1984 in the lead up to Christmas. Originally broadcast from mid-November with the final going out on Christmas Eve. Appropriately so as the story actually concludes on Christmas Eve. It was based on the novel The Box of Delights. John Macefield, the author, was Britain's poet laureate from 1930 until his death in 1967. The novel itself is actually a sequel to another book featuring the main character Kay Harker, called The Midnight Folk, and tells a similar, albeit non-Christmas set story, of various magical adventures young Kay has in his attempt to thwart the evil Abner Brown. Although there never was a TV adaptation of The Midnight Folk, I guess it's still supposed to be canon in this version, as Kay seems to recognise various characters that he encounters, despite the lack of reference to any previous adventure. If you read the original novels, it's easy to see why they chose to adapt The Box of Delights and not The Midnight Folk. It is the superior work. Also, I'd say the television version of Box is one of those rare occasions of a live-action adaptation actually being superior to the written work. Although everything that happens in the TV series is derived from the novel, the action does come across as much more of an episodic flight of fantasy in the book. The TV version takes the events of the novel and imbues it all with a great sense of mystery and drama, absent from the original text. This was quite an achievement because ultimately there isn't really much of a payoff to the story. It's not a densely layered narrative, it's more of a tall tale. There were certain logistical things that proved tricky to translate. Having a human character engage in conversation with a rat works perfectly fine on the page. But when adapted to live action, you are faced with the problem of whether or not to make your rodent characters rodent or human sized. You'll note the series does both at various points. The TV version does attempt to imbue the original narrative with a sense of dense weightiness that wasn't really present in the novel. This was largely down to the fact that the TV version was really the first children's drama serial to be treated with the same amount of passion and scope as your average adult-oriented drama. Also, don't forget, this was 1980s BBC, a time when the Beeb was producing the finest drama in the world. A unique element to this series was the combination of live action and animation. A lot of the sequences featuring magic use animation and it's really beautiful animation. At certain points, Kay enters a cartoon world a la Mary Poppins and transforms into a series of animals. First a fawn, then a grey lag goose, and finally a roach. It's very sword in the stone. At other points, animated characters appear in the real world. The use of animation was a masterstroke. It conveys brilliantly to a child the sense that these creatures and locales are magical and not of our world. The series itself is divided up into six half hours, three hours in total. What I'd like to do with you now is take you through some of the moments that have stayed with me over the years. I often say the mark of anything successful, be it a film or TV production, is how memorable it is. And likewise, the most damning criticism you can make of something is probably that it was forgettable. The fact that this series has so many moments that have stayed with me for over 25 years is surely testament to something special. Episode 1 is titled When the Wolves Were Running. The standout moments for me in Episode 1 are when Kay gets his first glimpse of magic. Old Mr Hawlings conjures up a phoenix appearing before him in the fire, a literal phoenix from the flames. Another memorable moment is the picture of the Alps scene. Cole Hawlings is cornered at Sea King's, Kay's home, 
and has to escape through a picture on the wall, presumably transporting him straight to Switzerland. Quite how he ends up back in the UK and able to proceed with the events of the rest of the series is never fully explained. I guess the box returns him off screen at some point. Also in this episode we meet Abner, the villain of the story, and his trusted associate, Rat, who has a predilection for green cheese. Bacon grind, I was hoping for, not just cheese. Now there's a character that really stuck out in the memory. Towards the end of the episode, Kay goes back in time to the age of King Arthur and winds up in an ancient encampment amidst the medieval battle. Episode 2 is titled Where the Knighted Showmen Go and opens with Kay having to leave the encampment through a portal as Cole Hawling's magic starts to fade. Whenever I think of this series as a whole, this is the image that instantly springs to mind. The battle encampment fading into the background and Patrick Troughton's character appearing in the foreground to speak to Kay. It's here he entrusts the box to Kay's safekeeping. This episode also contains the first instance of Kay going small. He encounters a couple of characters who previously appeared on the page in The Midnight Folk, and as I said, there's little to no explanation of how he knows them in the TV version. The first is Mouse. I don't know if the production had spent all the money at this point on the rat costumes and makeup, which were, it has to be said, pretty good, because this subpar pantomime costume this poor actor is saddled with really isn't in the same league. The other major character to appear in this episode is Hearn the Hunter. It's here we get the aforementioned anthropomorphism sequence. Episode 3 is titled In the Darkest Cellars Underneath. The memorable moments from this one are of a miniaturised Kay spying on Abner, all shot from a low angle. Kay getting Ellen the maid to make him a posset. A posset is a jorum of hot milk. And in that hot milk, you put some egg. And you put a spoon for a treacle. And a grating and nutmeg. And then you stir them well up. And then you gets into bed. And you takes it. Yes, I have tried making one of these, and I can attest to the fact that made properly, they are absolutely delicious. This one ends with possibly my favourite moment from the whole series, the sailboat sequence, involving Kay and his friends evading capture from the fake clergymen who have come to Scrobble them. Scrobble is their plummy Edwardian slang term for kidnapping. I was scrobbled. They evade capture by miniaturising themselves and escaping downstream on a toy sailboat. It looks a little funny because it's obviously just four stick figures glued to a toy boat, but every time they cut to a close-up, it does actually become quite a dramatic sequence, especially as they head towards some little rapids, which leads into episode 3's cliffhanger. Are they going to survive? Episode 4 is titled The Spider in the Web. The moment that stands out the most for me in this one is the revelation at the end about the origin of Cole Hawlings. It's him! It's the old Pops and Judy man! But he must be 500... 700 years old! This would fascinate me as a child. The concept of a character that's lived so long people have forgotten who they were originally, so they can now pass incognito as a relatively harmless member of society. Of course, it's something of a hackneyed trope now in fantasy fiction, but you've got to remember this was all new and fresh to me at the time. A cliché is never a cliché the first time you see it. I've never quite worked out why the picture of Raymond Lully in the book changes though. It could just be a way of visualising Chubby Joe's realisation, I don't know. Is there some sort of magic at play in the room here, or is it merely his point of view as he puts two and two together? I've never been too sure. Episode 5 is titled Beware of Yesterday. Now I have to admit I don't really remember the later episodes in this series as vividly as the earlier ones. Episodes 5 and 6 are a little more hazy than episodes 1 to 4. I believe I had this series partially taped for a while. I say partially because I believe my mum forgot to tape the final episode of the 86 edited version, which is why episodes 5 and 6 don't really stand out as much in the memory banks. I believe I did see them at least once though, because there's a sequence where Kay travels into the past and journeys across an ocean of 80s animation, which I'm fairly certain I saw at some point. 
It wasn't as immediately present in the memory banks as the earlier stuff though. The whole Arnold Toady sequence is possibly the most un-Christmassy section of the entire series and that could be why it didn't stick in my mind. It did ring a very faint bell when I re-watched the series as an adult but because it's so tonally out of sync with the rest of the series there's a chance I assume this imagery was for something different entirely. Having this barren section set in a sunny climate. Well, a TV studio unconvincingly made up to appear as a sunny climate is slightly at odds with the Christmas trees and snowdrifts of the rest of the series. Episode 6 is titled Leave Us Not Little Nor Yet Dark. I'm fairly certain I would have seen this one at least once because a lot of it rings a bell for me. Things like Kay hiding in the turnips of Abner Brown's trousers, the upside down brass head, the waterfall boy, Kay diving into the water to retrieve the box and bursting back to full height. I think there's certain elements to the latter part of the series that have a very Peter Davidson era Doctor Who vibe to them, especially in the final episode. The brass head would have looked more at home in Doctor Who than it does in this. But there you go, this is just what children's television looked like at the time. The final 10 minutes of the series featuring the escape from Abner's dungeon and the rescue of Cole Hawlings along with all the other Scrabble victims is some very entertaining stuff. And the snowstorm at the end was the only snowy sequence in the series to not be filmed on location. As an aside, this series was unusual at the time for a television production because it had to be filmed 12 months in advance as opposed to the standard six, just so they could shoot in real snow and produce something for the festive season. It was filmed Christmas 83, but wasn't broadcast until Christmas 84, and I can only believe the series greatly benefited from this longer than usual post-production period. They really had time to refine a few things. The editing, the music, the animation, the effects work. The final snowstorm sequence where they are up to their midriffs is the only studio bound snowy section. I mean it doesn't look super convincing but it at least retains the same charm and quality street aesthetic as the rest of the series and it works as a sequence. They use the box to escape and rescue Abner's kidnap victims and I love the ending. It's so of its time and I sincerely doubt you would get an ending like this in something now but the final obstacle to overcome is to simply get everyone to church in time for midnight mass. There's something very old fashioned and charming about this. It's very 1930s and again sorry to sound like a broken record but this really takes me back to my childhood. I went to a Church of England village primary school and attending services around Christmas time was very much a part of my early education. What can I say, this series is total nostalgia for me and yet so much more. This series was my upbringing. The Box of Delights really spawned a golden age of high quality children's drama. Easily the most memorable for people of my generation was the BBC's version of The Chronicles of Narnia which was again adapted by Alan Seymour. You probably wouldn't have got this series if the Box of Delights hadn't been such a big hit. This really did up the stakes when it came to high quality children's drama in the 80s and I'd argue you can still see the ripple effects today. Currently the BBC is broadcasting a new adaptation of Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials in the run up to Christmas. Hey if it can work for the Box of Delights in 1984 it can work for the BBC's latest snowbound fantasy drama in 2019. I think this is one of the greatest pieces of television ever. The direction by Rennie Rye is superlative, creative, competent and effortlessly efficient. Devin Stanfield is eminently likeable as Kay Harker. His poshness might be a little off-putting to some. I don't like the boy Kay Harper, I think he's too posh. But that's actually more a fault with the writing of the character rather than Stanfield's performance. Do I have any quibbles? Yes I do. They're not things that prevent me from enjoying the series at all. But you can't deny that the whole thing does have some terrible production values. I mean this wasn't unique to this series. This was just sadly the way it was for British drama of the time. I think one of the reasons the writing on TV was so good in this era was because the BBC put absolutely zero effort into the production values so the talent had to go somewhere. I mean I Claudius is one of the greatest pieces of television writing ever as is Boys from the Black Stuff, Pennies from Heaven, the works of Dennis Potter and Alan Bleasdale and they all had terrible production values. The sets were wobbly, the special effects were far from special. These amazing television landmark shows just looked a little bit cheap. So I think it's a real testament to both the writing and the passion involved on the production side of Box that they managed to overcome these technical limitations and create something that retains such a sense of magic and wonder. 
it works so well despite its technical limitations. Possibly my only criticism of the story itself comes in literally the final 60 seconds when it transpires it was all a dream. Why they did this I don't know. I think they were going for the Wizard of Oz ending. I would much prefer it and I'm fairly certain I thought this at the time also if they had done away with this. I think children want the magic to be as real as possible. There's no reason from a narrative standpoint for it all to be a dream. It absolutely stands up under its own logic. Making it all a dream just instantly devalues any investment you had in the characters, the dramatic stakes the story as a whole had up until that point. So it's a real shame they decided to leave it in. In fact, when I watch it, I tend to ignore the dream ending, because I want the magic to be real. And so much of this is magic. This should be more than a cult series. As I said, this should be on every year. It should be a festive favourite and a classic. It should be regarded as a classic in the same way a Christmas Carol is regarded as a classic. There's real magic at work here in this one. So there you have it folks, those are my thoughts on the Box of Delights, and I urge you to go out and buy the DVD. If you haven't seen it, check it out. If you have seen it, try and introduce new people to it. Despite its dated look, it's right for rediscovery by a new generation, especially kids. Merry Christmas everyone, I'll see you all in the new year, and until then, this is me Big Buddha signing off, and I shall see you all out there in YouTube land. Are they going to survive?